be like an interview, you know, like Janice, the interviewer, talking to these gentlemen out here, but I really want this to be a conversation and not an interview. And uh, you heard their credentials, they older than I am. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm the young person here on the stage. And if you notice, they're white. <laughs> you know, and um, on Daily Coast, I'm always jumping on people's, down people's butts about South bashing. Let me tell you something, as a black person, I trust white people who are in the movement from the South. Because they don't smile in your face and stab you in the back. Both of them, you know, because liberals in the North, let me tell you. <laughs> so, uh, these gentlemen have been in the movement longer than I have, have put their lives on the line, and I want them to really talk about uh, white people organizing. You know, because I can talk about black and Puerto Rican organizing until you're blue in the face. But y'all are white people, most of you. And y'all need to hear from other white folks. So I'm going to turn it over to them. And then we'll have some dialogue. If I have questions, I'll interrupt them. So. <laughs> you got it. Uh, I, I wanted to come off of our last uh, presenter and tell you a story about uh, Dr. Barber and the NAACP which uh, uh, is a, in North Carolina is predominantly black still, although it's getting a, a little more white people in. Uh, this is a story about Wake County. You saw uh, Dog Dog's map of Wake County and the black section there. And what happened was the Tea Party first uh, uh, surfaced in North Carolina, in Wake County, where they took over the school board and used uh, George Wallace's slogan <coughs> like force busing and stuff like that, and tested that out. And, that, and uh, Bill, that, that map there came off of their understanding that you could easily take over Wake County, which is a fairly progressive community on the whole, has had a pretty good history, uh, easily by uh, suppressing the black vote and splitting black and white people. And Reverend Barber uh, uh, actually in 2000, uh, probably 2008 or 9, when, when Margiotta and Tedesco, some of your North Carolinians will recognize these names, took over that school board. And he had gone down there and uh, uh, started raising hell in the school board meeting along with a bunch of the rest of us. And he was going to bed one night in Goldsboro, where he lives, and he picks up the News and Observer, and he sees this edit letter to the editor from a woman named Nancy Petty. Now, Nancy Petty is the only open lesbian, white lesbian leader in North Carolina of a Southern Baptist church uh, in, in Raleigh, and she has two adopted kids. She and her partner has two kids, which are black, who go to the Wake County schools. So Nancy uh, has heard about Reverend Barber. She's never met him. And she writes a letter to the editor saying, saying uh, although Nancy cusses quite freely, uh, <laughs> she didn't cuss in this letter. And she said what Reverend Barber was doing was absolutely right, and these goddamn people should uh, go back in their caves, the people that were running the school board. <laughs> Reverend Barber tells this story better than me. But, uh, he says about 11 o'clock at night, he He's reading, reading the News Observer, and he says, I got to call her. But, and he says to his wife, she, you think it's too late to call her? And she says, she knows that he's already decided to call her. <laughs> she says, go ahead and call her. Now, he doesn't know who she is. It just says Nancy Petty. And he said, Miss Petty, I just read your, uh, your letter, and it was so wonderful. You know, I get discouraged sometimes. And to hear from you, he, had, he doesn't know what color she is or anything. And she says, oh, Reverend Barber, I just love you. I love what you're doing. What can I do to help and stuff like that? And uh, he says, well, uh, I'd love to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you sometime soon and see. And she said, I, I got two kids in the school and everything, and I want to help. So he meets with her. She tells him then that she's the Reverend Nancy Petty. She still doesn't tell him she's a lesbian. She figures he knows. It's fairly well known in Rob. And they begin uh, uh, an alliance 
She agrees to get arrested with him the next time they get arrested. He's already been arrested once. She goes over there and he has him, uh, Nancy sitting next to him, and then Tim Tyson, who's a white guy, and Mary Williams, this wonderful black gospel singer that's a real good friend of ours. The four of them get arrested. They actually go up and uh, Margie out and the school board and people leave their seats to go out because they don't know what to do and they sit on the school board and start conducting a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Still, Reverend Barber does it. style. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was a beautiful tactical uh, operation. And then uh, uh, something happens and Reverend Barber says, finds out that Nancy is a lesbian. Now, Reverend Barber, like most of us old timers, is homophobic as hell, just like me and Bob that we're working on. And she says, uh, she's, he says, oh, is that right? And she says, yeah. And he says, that's wonderful. And she's, and you're a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. And she educates him, sitting over this uh, while they're in jail and doing Good stuff together. <laughs> now, uh, fast forward a couple of years, where we all become real fast friends with Nancy, and she's bringing in all these gay and lesbian people into the movement. And the uh, right wing decides they're going to do this trick, this Amendment 1. They're going to stick it on the ballot. And we're talking, uh, and uh, we say, what are we going to do about that? And uh, some of his senior advisors, including... Uh, Outlaw and gay marriage. Yeah. yeah. Out oh, I'm sorry. That's what it was. Yeah. Outlaw and gay marriage. Uh, making it a constitutional violation in North Carolina. So Reverend Barber says... But we've got to do something about that because I love Nancy Petty. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, but uh, my sister that just went on before, this whole way the Southern people think it's an all relationship. Yeah. It's all uh, just getting to know people and spending time with people <laughs> and doing things together. So he, uh, uh, Caitlin Breedlove, who is a member of Song and a good friend of ours, invites Reverend Barber to speak at the Equality North Carolina dinner. Um, on Amendment 1. And uh, we write this wonderful uh, 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 piece that starts out, if you're for or, whether you're for or against gay marriage, you've got to be against Amendment 1. That was the line. It was taken from a fairly good lawyer in uh, Russia named B.I. Lenin. And his, uh, his, his uh, a wonderful thing on the right of nations to self-determination and the right of women. And uh, not to put discrimination in constitutions. Yes, yeah, exactly. Amen. So, you need uh, the long work. story short. <laughs> Wrap it up. Not uh, I think I've already made my point, actually. <laughs> That, that was the beginning of this wide open thing that ended up with the national NAACP changing its policy, with Obama changing its policy, and it all began because Nancy Betty and Reverend Barber became good friends. Yeah, yeah. Sister Mary said from Song, she started by sitting on the porch. Yeah. And um, those of you who blog, how many of you have come to visit us on the front porch at Black Coast? Not enough of you. It's called, it says Black Coast, and two thirds of the people in there are white Cossacks. <laughs> All right? So they get picked on because they hang out in Black Coast, so they think those are those black people. And in fact, some of them can justify movie meister. How often have you been called a racist? A lot. Okay. We're black. Notice she white. Um, so this whole idea of just like how many of you are members of the NACP? How many are not? Okay. We need you. We need right. to sign up. Thirty five. Thirty five. This is something that we need to get past. This sitting down and talking to each other on the porch and understanding that we can be part of each other's organizations. I'm a member of, I can't even tell you how many LBGTQ organizations I've been part of from the beginning, okay? And um, so, and I'm a member of Latino organizations, Native American organizations, Asian American organizations, feminist groups, you name it. Because what Reverend Barber was talking about was intersectionality, yes. and and Bob, you were you were talking to me yesterday about organizing the class issues involved too, 
because we need to be reaching out to more working class folk, including white working class folk. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, and I'd like to thank uh, Mary for bringing up all these questions. And uh, I am Bob Zellner, and I started out in uh, Alabama, where my dad was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, my granddad was in the Klan, and they were both graduates of Bob Jones College. Not exactly a hotbed of Southern progressivism. I uh, very luckily went to college in Montgomery, Alabama, where I met Martin Luther King and Mrs. Rosa Parks, and they started me on a life of crime. So I joined SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of course, uh, in 1961. I was the first white Southerner to be a field secretary for SNCC, so I went through all of those campaigns. There came a time in SNCC when it was time for white people in SNCC to go organize white people. Now, I wasn't going to go organize rich, old, white people in the South. The question was to organize poor and working class white Southerners. And I'll pause right there for a minute to say that among my leftist friends and my progressive friends who always say black and white unite and fight, the last thing they want to do and actually do is talk to, live with, and work with poor and working class people, especially Southerners who are racist. We don't do that very well. You can see that we meet among ourselves quite well and that we are comfortable with a certain degree of integration. Well, we're working now. Uh, in SNCC, when it became possible to organize white people, we formed GROW, Grassroots Organizing Work. We also call it Get Rid of Wallace. <laughs> Thank God you're old enough to know who Wallace, which Wallace I'm talking about. We demonstrated that far back that if you go to poor and working class white Southerners with a materialist program, not an idealistic one of doing the right thing and being a good Christian, you can make them or you can organize them to unite with black brothers and sisters around their common economic problems. We are still faced in North Carolina and the rest of the country with 1% that has the power, the money, and the intelligence to get poor and working class people to vote for their 1% uh, program against their own interests time and time again. In North Carolina, under the moral movement, the forward together, uh, not one step back moral movement, under the leadership of the North Carolina NAACP, we are beginning to reach white Southerners who said, while, you, while the extreme right was shooting at gays and women, and immigrants, they are hitting us. They're shooting at Latino, Latinos and immigrants, and they're hitting us. So we have to develop still a program to uh, self-consciously approach poor and working class white Southerners. If we change only a significant percentage of them, we change the South. And if we change the South, you know we change the country. And globally, thinking globally, we will move our nation from a conservative reactionary column into a progressive column and save the climate and everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this also is inspired by uh, the sister before us. Is her name Mary? Uh, Mary. Mary. Yes. Um, uh, is the lessons we learn. I just want to throw Mary some out before we open this up for questions. So uh, the lesson we've learned, Bob and I both, from organizing in the South, and particularly uh, my wife and I moved to uh, Appalachia the same time Bob moved to New Orleans <coughs> and tried to organize coal miners. Uh, black and white people together, and it, just having meetings with black and white people in Pike County, Kentucky, was called sedition, trying to overthrow the government, which we were arrested for. And uh, our, we got dynamited out of there, and we had trouble with Senator McClellan also. Uh, so, uh, the uh, number one lesson, which uh, Mary mentioned, was that in the South, uh, I've been trying to write this book for about 30 years off of my FBI files, 
And, uh, get her done, get her done, get her done. Well, I, changed, I changed the name of it, but uh, uh, my, new, my latest name is called Make New Friends, Keep the Old. One is silver, the other is gold. And there's going to be stories from doing what Bob is talking about and what, we, what we've been doing is that uh, organizing is really reorganizing. People have always been organized. They've organized along racial lines in the South. We want to reorganize people to, uh, and have them make new friends. That doesn't mean they have to give up everything uh, and reject everything in the past, but they, sh but they need to reach out and make new friends, particularly progressives. It has to be an intentional, conscious act. I think that's what the sister was talking about. Stop worrying about whether you're white or black or gay or straight and go out and get to work. That's, that's the number one, uh, uh, number one lesson that we learn. Uh, second lesson is we need full-time organizers. SNCC had, at, at its height had 100, 150 full-time organizers like Bob and me and other people uh, in the South driving around, had a, had a little credit card, got paid $15 a week if we were lucky. Uh, had ten dollars. We started ten, with ten dollars yeah. a week, <laughs> and had to live, find places to live. We didn't stay in no fancy hotels. We had Carl Braden, Carl and Ann Braden's rule that I worked for was: if you uh, can't find somebody to stay with that night, you sleep in the car because that means you're not really working. <laughs> Your job was to go find people to stay with and eat breakfast. Well, we would recruit a lot of people at breakfast time. Is that not right? We would talk trash at breakfast. Trash, trash at breakfast, <laughs> and then serious commitment at lunch. Uh, the uh, the uh, third lesson was uh, that black and white people had to work together. Fusion, and we we we've been struggling with this issue. Uh, Bob and I have for sixty years. How does how do you work that? It's it's and there's no. There's no formula for it. No formula for it. Ann, Ann Braden, uh, Mary mentioned several times, we'd ask Ann, how do you, how do you win white people to struggle against racism? You work, 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 and get them together and do things together. And, and the shortcut was any way you can. Any way you can. <laughs> and uh, one at a time. You know, there's no magical thing to do in it. And the last lesson, that uh, I want to do before we open it up is Bob and I went down there in 60 back to the south in 67, uh, 66, 67, coming off Black Power. Stokely and Willie Ricks get on uh, in 1966 and James Meredith got shot and they went down to Black Power, Black Power on TV, you remember that? And then and, and the question was what do white people in the movement do? And uh, the consensus was, which we totally agreed with, was that we needed to go into not the white community. We want to disrupt the white community. We want to smash the white community. I don't like that term. White people. Yeah, there's still people identify as white, and we've gone. That's still a longer struggle. But we want to uh, work with human beings. We want to work with human beings, members of God's human family. And that's the goal, is to get people thinking about themselves in a slightly different way. That's going to be a longer struggle, but certainly we shouldn't give them the white community. We need to bust up the white communities. Uh, so the question uh, that is still, we're still experimenting with, and one of the lessons that we have learned working with Reverend Barber, uh, you know, I've been working with him for 12 years now, <coughs> is that having strong black leadership and militant black leadership, black leadership uh, like Black Lives Matters that is going right at the racism in our system is uh, necessary to win white people to the struggle against racism. I know within the Democratic Party and the Progressive <coughs> Democratic Party, there's always been two-line struggle on that question. <coughs> and I think the Daily Coast on the whole has been on the right side on that. Where's, where's Marco? He's gone. Just went to yes, sir. All right, but at any rate, <laughs> the, whole, <laughs> your name is the whole question is, do you get more white people to vote in a, in a progressive way if you downplay the uh, fundamental contradiction of racism in our country, or do you get more white people to get active and uh, vote correctly if there's a strong, uh, bold, 
in your face uh, 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 letting people know how racist the society is, and, and in this case, the cops killing people and stuff like that, which goes. Now, what Obama, I believe, proved to some degree, and I think the coast was on the right side, that the more people you get uh, uh, registered to vote, the, you know, the more people you get involved, the better. You're, tru you're trusting that the people will not be turned off and suckered by the uh, racist Tea Party, uh, George Wallace line. But to me, that's that's the key issue in this electoral work that we got. Okay. So there may be questions. Yeah. Questions. Uh, Chris Do we have time? Chris has a question. We've got two minutes. I've got a really quick, really quick question. Chris, I promise it'll be quick. Um, but it needs a little bit. Of, how many people know what a multi generational home is? If I say multi generational home, okay, good. Uh, people don't live in multi-generational homes because they love each other. Let me just say that. So I was in Florida recently, like I said, and one of the things that came up was people said, well, I'm out registering voters, but I'm registering mostly Republicans. And you'd say, where have you gone? Well, I've gone to the you know, more affluent neighborhoods because it's friendly to walk there. Yes. I like opening the doors. Um, how is it that you've been able to help encourage more people to go, you know, we need to go visit the people who, you know, you're not, that's where you need to go, where the people have the financial interest, the, the, the economic investment, um, a, a more diverse racial community. How do you, uh, how have you helped influence people to reach those communities? Then can I take a quick shot at that? Uh, it's a very good question. And one of the ways that you, uh, you get to people who are in multi-generational families and uh, is go where the people are. For instance, uh, we're working in North Carolina with uh, the mayor of uh, uh, Bell Haven, North Carolina, mm -hmm. a white Republican mayor who has already walked twice from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. to save the hospital in Bell Haven, North Carolina. Uh, his name is uh, Mayor Adam O'Neill, and uh, I walked with him two years, both years. I'm 76, and it got me back in shape, but I walked uh, from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., two years running. And then he said, what we need to do is have a North Carolina walk. So while the settlement to D.C. walk was going on, the mayor uh, and a lot of people from Bell Haven began a walk, black and white, black and white from, Mel, from Bell Haven, North Carolina, to Raleigh, North Carolina, to where we go every moral Monday to confront the legislature. So that's going on now. When you work in a community like that, you have a trip. That community is 70% black, and uh, really the movement group there depends on the black vote and maybe about half of the small white vote. Um, and that's when you really get out and register people to vote who are involved in a everyday struggle to get their hospital back, something basic. And it brings up the whole question in North Carolina of why the extreme right wing, which is uh, Republican right now, uh, turned away Medicaid. So you have this white mayor from Bellhaven with all of his black friends walking from Bellhaven to Raleigh to say to this extremist legislature, you have to extend Medicaid and you have to open up these rural hospitals that are closing just for profit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add, yeah. oh, Joan, where's Joan? Joan wrote about this on the, fr on, the, on the front page for Daily Curse, and a lot of people weren't paying attention because it was rural. And that's another thing that we have to, we cannot just be urban focused. I'm, I'm going to go uh, to follow up on Bob's answer that, um, and my, uh, what I think is the most important point is that when you have strong black leadership, which we do in North Carolina, a strong anti-racism leadership, that doesn't matter what color it was, if Reverend Barber, as you heard yesterday, is serious business about dismantling the racist system in this in this nation and around the world. He, he's an internationalist. Wait till you get him talking about uh, Africa and other places. So uh, uh, and when Reverend uh, Leslie, you remember when uh, 
uh, Tim Tyson's got a call from people in Mitchell County to come out here. Okay, and yes. uh, uh, Reverend Barber came out there, and he thought he would get killed. That he was Mitchell, a little afraid. Mitchell <laughs> County had a rule that no black people after sundown. He goes into an all-white so church right. in Mitchell County, which is just uh, it's over on, on the Kentucky and the Tennessee border. And he says, we've got to be out of here by dark. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, I'm not staying after dark. My point is well, that... Well, welcome, uh, you guys. But, uh, it, it ends up, why did the people invite him? In other words, the question of having a people, white people uh, working with a black leader was taken care of right away. They wanted Reverend Barber to come, just like you all wanted to have him come here. Because he was human, he had open arms, and he says, you, you know, uh, if you love me, you gotta love my anti-racist colleagues. You, you gotta love them. <laughs> <laughs> And they established a, an NAACP chapter up there. Oh yeah, in Yancey County. Black. I think Yancey County is represented here today. We, yeah. we have... Right <laughs> Any time... Um, and my, what I remember is I worked on Dr. King's Poor People campaign in East Kentucky. I was the hillbilly organizer. I was trying to bring uh, poor white people and coal miners up to D.C. to the Resurrection City and to the Poor people's campaign. Questions. And, Questions. and if, if Dr. King had not been killed uh, two weeks before that, and he had come, we'd have gotten 10 times as many people. Right. So that, that's, that's an easy way to remember that principle. You have a question? Yes. Um, I wanted to thank you. I'm a bit of an interloper because I'm coming from Michigan. But the town I live in, Ypsilanti, is also called Ipsitaki um, because there's just been so much migration. Yes. And I really appreciate what Mary had to say and what you had to say about the Southern approach because it is relevant um, for the people we're dealing with. It's a, um, a mixed uh, population in my town and I'm a precinct organizer and I'm going to go back home and tell people we have to make provisions contrary to what we're always told to make the time to talk to people, to actually sit down and engage with people, be willing to go in, all that kind of stuff, which is totally contrary to what going by the book mm -hmm. um, canvassing is about. So I thank you for those insights. Yes, absolutely. Great point. We had, in SCUF, we had a, a slogan, uh, Bob, you remember, it said, we had a little pamphlet that said there's 40 million white people in the South. Who's Who will organize that? The Ku Klux Klan or oh, yeah. the movement? The movement. Yeah. yeah. Right and that's, I think that's the way we need to look at it. The, the Tea Party's out organizing. Up. It's doing better organizing. They sit around, they do shit. You know, they bite people to little picnics and stuff like that. What are we doing? Well, wouldn't your comment on that? There's another question. Um, you know, this uh, organizing at the grassroots, uh, in North Carolina is going national. Finally, we're breaking out. Is going national. Yes. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, one of the things that it is causing is a cultural revolution inside many organizations. So if you feel a little stress in uh, in daily toast, you're not alone on that. The NAACP is one of the grandest old establishments in the country. And if you go to national events, it's 99.9% .9 black. And we wonder if the grand old party of the uh, civil rights movement uh, flagship, the NAACP, is going to make room for the new Latino uh, leadership, the new LBGTQ leadership, the young leadership, the women's leadership, and so forth. So it has to be a cultural revolution in all of our organizations now because we're on the brink of the greatest progressive, radical, revolutionary era yeah. this country has ever seen. Yeah. Right. Yes, hi. The, the original mission of Daily Coast was more and better Democrats. That was how it was phrased. Specifically, capital D Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand and appreciate the importance of the grassroots organizing that is really vital. Uh, what I don't understand is how that articulates with changing the Democratic Party to be more democratic. Oh, man. Take a shot at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you start, which uh, we do, from the uh, 
principle that the issue of racism, that is the whole history of slavery and race-based uh, working conditions, particularly in the South, and then the hundred years of uh, Jim Crow that we're just coming out of. You say Jim Crow started in 1870. Uh, that, um, and, and we believe that's the uh, fundamental problem of our, of our uh, democracy, the fundamental problem, and certainly it is in the South. Uh, so the NAACP was designed and run by very radical people. Dr. Du Bois, who was our executive director for the first, uh, from uh, 1909, when a group of white radical Marxists and Dr. Du Bois, who was a black radical Marxist, set up the NAACP. And uh, uh, all members of the Communist Party had to belong to it in the 30s. And they all paid their $30. And uh, I don't think it was $30 back then. <laughs> uh, but uh, that the NAACP in its height, and while Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston and Paul e. Murray and other people were, designed, were working out the uh, legal framework to attack Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, there was no question about uh, its partisan thing. They'd work, we have no friends and no enemies. That's always been, we have uh, temporary tactical allies. That was always the NAACP's role as, as the Republican Party began to be hijacked, particularly in, in the uh, 40s and 50s and 60s by, uh, you know, uh, Dixie Grant. Well, Birchites to start with, it was, you know, it was Daddy Coke uh, hijack. He was the one that paid to hijack and work with Goldwater in 64. Uh, so you have to know that history uh, to understand what, why this is a difficult problem in the South. Uh, if I'm the Daily Kosha, I've been a, a reader of the Daily Kosha ever since it started, and I've been a liberal Democrat my whole life, but that doesn't have anything to do with being a, a movement organizer. A movement organizer and the developing a strong, independent movement that keeps everybody honest is uh, what, uh, what we know is the most radical thing you can do. It's the most radical thing you can do in this country is to keep the Democratic Party honest. Yeah, and particularly on the race and gay and women questions. Okay. We only have time for two more questions and they're already spoken for, so I'll bring the mic to you in just a second. And please make them short because we're running out of time. Uh, thank you. Hi guys, how are you? Hello. Uh, one thing I've noticed a, a lot, and you focused on this uh, earlier, Bob, and that was looking and approaching uh, the southern poor white voting bloc. And it's, it's really a, um, a, a a dichotomy that's built as a stereotype, and there's a valuable lesson here for all of us, and yep. that is in history. And that history is that in the Confederacy, during the war, there were vast, vast swaths of poor white Southerners that absolutely hated the Confederacy. That's right. They, yeah, were, that's they, right. they, were, they were guerrillas. They were undercover folks. They were spies. There were massive amounts of people who left so what I'm saying is when you see somebody, a young man in a beat-up pickup truck, waving the Confederate flag in the back, what you can say to him is this, wow, you must be from a wealthy Southern family. Yeah. And, 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 and this kid is going to go, well, no, I'm just a poor guy from, well, then you can't be uh, from a Confederacy. They didn't Confederate support the Confederacy. Confederate. Because, yeah, because we, we uh, you know, uh, the Southern white folks uh, didn't like the Confederacy, uh, most of them any better, because let's face it, it was the oligarchy. It was the one percent of those people, the Confederate owners and the plantation owners, that that millions of poor white people died for for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. So we need to always remember that. And I just want to pass this. That's up. good. That's stereotype. One more question. Stereotype. One more question. Well, that wasn't a question, but <laughs> there's another interesting aspect to all this about organizing that I think is kind of coming into play in this part of the world. And that is, I got into the NAACP when it was being reorganized down in Henderson County after a lapse of a long time. Shortly thereafter, that put me in touch with Carmen and Isaac, who and I, whom I've been with a number of times. But the interesting aspect was 
with, to get Reverend Barber out here for a group that to speak for a moral Monday in the mountains, <clears throat> about 35 people came together. They were not NAACP except Carmen and Elaine Light and Isaac and a few others. They were people from the social action world, mm -hmm. people who have to minister in some of these situations, a lot of nonprofits. That's a good way to network that's not being discussed so far. When you network with other people who have a concern, you bypass it and you form a thing called a Mountain People's Assembly. Yeah. When that was coming together, we were hopeful we didn't want to be embarrassed with only 200 people showing up. <laughs> and the most conservative estimates were 8,000 came together Woo! three weeks later. Yeah. And so I think that it behooves the NAACP and all these other groups to be sure we're networking with all the other groups because that's the way you get it around the day. Amen. Just to, that's true in the mountains that uh, we have over 250 now partners in our coalition, in the Forward Together Coalition, including every major church uh, in, the, in the state and in the country is a part of our coalition. I wanted to just thank both we didn't uh, let you our, speak. No, I, I'm not here to speak, but I am here to say one thing. You can come and visit us, drop into Black Coast, and I've had white people say to me, but what do I say? <laughs> <laughs> say hello, and then you brought some sweet tea and some chocolate. <laughs> and I love you. Thank you. Now we have a sandwich buffet out in the uh, reception area. Where